Our kidneys are essential for so many functions in the body, from salt and water balance to excreting toxins. Yet when kidney function is impaired, there are often no symptoms. It's so silent that only half of those who need renal dialysis know about it. And more than one in three seniors has chronic kidney disease and most are unaware. So how do we make sure our kidneys don't die before we do? And is it possible to reverse deterioration in renal function? Stand by, Go Healthy For Good starts right now. Hello and welcome to Go Healthy For Good. One day, we visited Weimar Lifestyle Center where we found Rabbi Newman had just completed his second immersion program there. Here he reflects on how he came to be there in the first place, watch. I ate a lot of stuff, stuff that wasn't good for me, and I didn't realize how bad eating normal or eating, which I thought was normal, and I was on all kinds of diets. I was on Atkins diet, I was on all these other things, and as far as I knew, I was doing okay. But in the meantime, I had gotten, I had a quadruple bypass, and nobody ever told me anything as far as uh, what to eat the right way, but I figured after that, I w went on Atkins because everybody was talking about Atkins. And after that, I tried uh, different kinds of diets and I thought I was doing good but I kept gaining weight at one point if I wanted to walk from let's say from one corner to the other I would have to stop at least four or five times I couldn't walk I could hardly walk problem was that I just felt out of breath and I felt that I just couldn't move and if I had to walk, let's say, around the corner to my car, it took me forever to get to it. And it was really, I felt really terrible. At, at that point, I went back to my cardiologist and she, they sent me to a nephrologist and he says, they gotta put me on dialysis. And I come back and I tell my brother, who's an alternative medicine doctor, and he goes, no way. Uh, he, I'm, I'm gonna send you somewhere to work on you. I said, where are you sending me? He says, don't worry, it's a good place. So I said, nah, I'm not going anywhere. A few hours later, he comes in and he gives me a ticket and he says, here's the ticket and you came back out on it. You're leaving uh, Thursday. No, it was on a Sunday and uh, you're going. I said, where am I going? He says, to Sacramento. I said, Sacramento, I have things to do over here. I can't. He says, your life is more important at this point. On today's show, the rabbi will tell us the rest of his incredible story. We'll delve into kidney disease and diet with a very experienced renal physician. Sean will put us through our paces. We'll enjoy another scrummy treat with Chef Mark Anthony and get it all rolling with the news. In the headlines, more kidney stones, improve your baby's brain, and delay dialysis and death. Kidney stones are on the rise. Researchers looked at the prevalence of kidney stones among more than 10,000 residents of Minnesota beginning in 1984. They found the frequency has increased more than fourfold among women and more than doubled among men over the span of 30 years. The largest increase was seen in young women ages 18 to 40. One reason for the increase is that more CT scans are being done, which happen to find the stones before they cause pain. Kidney stones are most often composed of calcium salts, either calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate. The best way to prevent them or even get rid of small ones is to get calcium in your diet from foods rather than supplements, to limit your salt intake and to drink two or three quarts or liters of water every day. 
Chronic inflammation in pregnant mothers may alter their children's brain organization after birth and their working memory two years later, according to a longitudinal study by German and US researchers. They followed 84 Californian women and measured levels of an inflammatory protein in their white blood cells during pregnancy. At four weeks of age, babies underwent a brain MRI to assess whole brain functional connectivity. Two years later, over half of the children returned to the lab for a memory game to measure their working memory. Researchers found a correlation between functional connectivity patterns in the baby's brain and the level of their mother's inflammatory markers in pregnancy. High levels of inflammation reliably predicted poorer memory at age two. Previous research has suggested maternal inflammation affects fetal neurodevelopment. So ladies, reduce your inflammatory markers with a whole food plant-based diet, adequate sleep, and regular exercise. An optimal diet and lifestyle in the early stages of chronic kidney disease, or CKD, may prolong life and delay initiation of dialysis. The third NHANES linked mortality file found adherence to four healthy lifestyle factors halved the risk of death. These included diet, exercise, body weight, and smoking. A healthy diet included a high intake of whole grains, legumes, nuts, fruits and vegetables, and a low intake of saturated fat and salt. A plant-based diet was shown to reduce metabolic acidity, lower blood pressure, and slow kidney injury. It altered gut flora so that fewer uremic toxins were produced, normalized weight, improved cardiovascular health. A low fructose diet reduced inflammatory markers and blood pressure whereas sugary drinks increased urinary protein loss, accelerated kidney damage, and decline. In pre-dialysis patients, a low-protein diet will reduce symptoms, improve electrolyte balance and control, protect against oxidative stress, and delay the need for dialysis. I'm Dr. Nerida McKibben, and that's today's Health News. Today's guest is Dr. Sean Hashmi, a kidney specialist or nephrologist with Kaiser Permanente. Here he explains how important our kidneys are and what they do. When a nephrologist meets a cardiologist, we always joke which one is the most important organ. So the cardiologist <laughs> says, well, there's one heart, but I say kidneys are so important that there's two of them. <laughs> but what's so fascinating about your kidneys is if you were to think about electrolytes, and there's a lot of people out there who talk about you can drink this electrolytes, that electrolytes. Electrolytes are such an important part of our body. There's a very, very tight range of electrolytes. Let's take potassium. Inside your blood, you have this really tight range of about three and a half to about five and a half milliequivalents of potassium per deciliter in the blood. Now, what's fascinating is, is if you get to about six and above, your risk of heart rhythms, abnormal heart rhythms goes up. And if you get above six and a half, you can die from an arrhythmia or an abnormal heart rhythm, six and a half. If you look at what's inside your blood cells, any cells inside your body, you have about 140 milligrams of potassium at any one time. So imagine if those cells broke down and released. None of us should be alive right now. So what do the kidneys do? They do the ultimate job of keeping us alive by balancing all of these electrolytes. Sodium, too low sodium, you can get seizures, coma, and death. Too high sodium, you can get seizures, coma, and death. So what a remarkable organ, in this case two, that can actually filter blood, remove toxins, remove all of those waste products, manage the water, because if you were drinking, water had nowhere to go, it would end up in the lungs and it would cause us not to be able to breathe. So what a remarkable organ that can manage to get all of those things in this really tight balance and yet takes punishment from us every single day. And last, if we take care of it, for our entire lives. True. Yeah. And so why do we have two? <laughs> <laughs> now tell me, how, how many people, what percent of the population end up dying from kidney failure. Yeah, so this is really interesting. There's a lot of people who are not even diagnosed who have kidney disease. And so part of what makes it very hard to track these statistics is the fact that many early stages of kidney disease go undiagnosed. The other part that's really 
difficult to talk about is the fact that kidney disease has no symptoms. So if you have somebody, even at their last stages of kidney disease, they may come to you for a simple thing like, I feel tired. And that's the only symptom they have. Yet inside their body, their potassium is really high. They have all these uremic toxins, so that's affecting all of their cells, but they don't notice it. This is how remarkable this kidney disease is. And when we look at just mortality, which is the death rate, kidney disease kills more people every single year than breast cancer. Wow. Yes. And it's one of the most under-talked about diseases that's out there. So a lot of other diseases, they get a lot more media attention. Kidneys, unfortunately, kidney disease, it does not. Dialysis, which is part of kidney disease, is such a difficult thing, but we just don't talk about it enough. And that's why I'm so grateful for this opportunity to talk about what is kidney disease, what it does, and how significant it is to all of the population out there. Especially since one in six of the population has kidney disease. So we're going to talk about it more with Dr. Hashmi in the next segment. Though before the break, check this out. <laughs> Oh man, I've got a headache. Do you have any aspirin? How much water have you had today? Uh, none, but I drink cola. Isn't that all right? Cola doesn't count here. Have some proper drink. Oh, how does that help? Well, your, your brain is 85% water, so when you get dehydrated, it gets very dehydrated. It shrivels up and it starts to ache. Well, I still need that aspirin because I've got an aching back. Really, low back pain can be related to dehydration. You know your joints and your discs? They're made of water. So if you're dehydrated, they're going to be sore. So well, I guess I'll drink to that then, huh? Yeah, why don't you? Then you'll feel much better. Hmm. However, what about this fatigue? Are you going to tell me that that's due to dehydration as well? Yes, you hit the nail on the head. You see, when your blood volume shrinks, your heart has to pump a lot faster. And the slightest exertion is going to make you feel exhausted. Mm. So you need to have more water. OK, well, is there anything you can do about this ringing in my ears? Yeah. When your blood gets that thick and it's trying to squeeze through tiny capillaries, you need to dilute it with some water. Some more water. More water. OK, well, what about this uh, cramping in my legs? What can I do for this leg cramps I'm having here? Well, if the circulation to your muscles isn't very good, they're going to ache and cramp. So I think you need some more water. OK. Well, what about this terrible pain I'm suddenly having in my bladder? Does dehydration cause kidney stones? It can do, but in your case, it probably would be cured by a quick trip to the bathroom. Oh, I'd better go right away. Are you sure that water doesn't cure this as well? Yeah, it cures many things, but a quick trip to the bathroom is what you need. Oh man, my bladder's about to splatter. All right, I'll see you in a minute. Look for the many signs of dehydration. And remember, drink six to eight glasses of water a day. Doctor's orders. Thanks for joining us today for another masterful creation from Chef Mark Anthony. Today he's got us making vegan jerky and here's what goes in it. Half a cup of Bragg's liquid aminos, half a cup of water, one quarter cup of brown sugar, two tablespoons of olive oil, that's optional, and an eight ounce packet of Butler soy curls. Look what I have here, I've got equal parts of water and soy sauce. Uh, 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 Bragg's liquid aminos, or if you're right. going to use the soy sauce, use the low sodium soy sauce. Equal parts like that of the liquid. We've got a little bit of brown sugar here. And, uh, and then I have uh, just a couple, one tablespoon of uh, olive oil. All right. Uh, which the only reason I do the olive oil yes. is to give it that sensation of grease. Okay. Uh, you really don't need to, and even when we're at home, I very often I don't use the, the uh, uh, oil. Okay, so it's more the sensation than the Just taste. Just because we're yeah. used to doing it that way. Right. But was that simple ingredients or what? Yeah, they're so all gone. Once this comes to a boil and the sugar gets dissolved, then we're going to add some of the butler soy curls. 
and I don't know if you've used Butler soy curls before, but... I have, and I wasn't sure quite what they were meant to be used for. Well, so I think I'm learning something today. I've used these on hundreds of different things. And really? Basically what it is, is just 100% whole soybeans, non-GMO. the beauty of these. It's just the whole bean. Pound for pound, when you add water to this, it's less expensive than chicken. Yeah, so, and I'll bet it's got a heap yeah. more protein too. Exactly. So this looks like it's boiling pretty good there. And then we're just gonna add this to it. Uh, now this is a very quick process here because once you get it here, you're gonna wanna give it a little stir like this. I don't know and if I wanna try that at home. It looks dangerous. Yeah, a wok works really good if you have a wok. Oh, um, Cause it's yep. got more of the, a curved yep. sides on it and yep. it conducts heat a little better. Um, right. uh, I do use a wok at home. Uh, oh, okay. But all you're doing is you can see where the water is starting to evaporate. Yep. So you're just going to keep working it until yeah. that water goes down. Yeah. And this and is an exact out. recipe uh, as far right. as the water content goes and the flavor and everything. Um, but we also have recipes for ones using A1 or 57 steak sauces. You can do teriyaki. Okay. And see, all you're doing is you've got enough to get that moisture in there and then it's kind of giving a so little you're steaming. rehydrating it and dehydrating it kind yeah, exactly. of at the same right, time. right 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 <laughs> you're getting that little steaming action in there yeah right and uh and and it's also crisping a little bit on the outside too so <laughs> um, but just like that and you you're done wow is that easy that's or it. what yeah that's it there's some right there if you want to try it uh and how because i would actually let this cool for a while yep um and then and it's going to tighten ready? up Oh, I've got to try this. Even more. Right. But it's great for camping, uh, doing different mm. things like that. You could use it right here, right now, and actually toss it on salads. If you wanted a sizzling salad, you'd have your entire salad, put yep. some of the hot on it, yep. and boom, you're ready to eat it. That is really, really good. Wow. I'm gonna have to Just go like and get Just like jerky. Some. It's got the mm. texture of jerky. It has, it's chewy mm -hmm. and tasty and mm. <laughs> Thanks, Mark, that's an awesome recipe. If you missed that recipe, just go to the website for that and all of our recipes. They're at hopetv.org slash go healthy. When Rabbi Newman was told he had kidney failure and needed dialysis, his brother said no way and enrolled him in the program at Weimar Lifestyle Center. Watch. So I came to Weimar and I was about 110 pounds heavier than what I am now. and. I followed the whole uh, diet, and it, actually it's not a diet, the whole lifestyle. When I came here, they told me that I was gonna, gonna have to walk. I said, I can't walk anything, I can't walk. They said, you'll walk. So the first day when the doctors saw me, it was on a Monday, and Dr. Lukens was the, my doctor at the time, and he goes, uh, he, he looks through I had to bring all my medications, so he looks through all the medications. There were about 25 medications at the time, and plus insulin. And uh, Dr. Lucan says, as of tomorrow, you don't take any of the meds. I go, Doc, are you sure? I said, do you have an ambulance on standby? So he starts laughing. He says, don't worry about it. We know what we're doing, and I, we wouldn't steer you wrong. So I go, okay. So I stopped the medications, and then I started, they told me I also have to walk. So uh, I, first they told me that the first thing is to, for me to try to walk around the pole. So I ch walked around the pole a little bit, and uh, then they came, one of the nurses comes out and says, okay, we're gonna walk the loop. I go, the loop, what is the loop? He says, don't worry. I said, what is the loop? She says, it's a roundabout going around, further around. So I said, okay, we'll try it. But I'm telling you right now, I hope you have time because I'm not a fast walker and I'm, it's gonna take me time. She says, don't worry, I'll be there with you. Everything is fine. She walked with me. It took me to walk the loop almost uh, an hour and a half. She came and, you know, she came with me. And then afterwards she told me, this is what you're gonna have to do on your own. And sure enough, by the time I finished 
the whole 18 days, I had lost quite a bit of weight and I was able to do the loop. I did the loop, in fact, uh, in 20 minutes and I did it afterwards 10 times going around before I left here. Amazing determination and progress. We're talking about kidneys and diet today with Dr. Sean Hashmi, a nephrologist who's also skilled in nutrition and weight management. I asked him about the most common causes of kidney disease. First is diabetes, second is high blood pressure, third is obesity. All three of those are entirely modifiable by what we eat, what we do, how we act. So all of those deaths that you're talking about from kidney failure, a high percentage are actually preventable. Yes. So what are, and, and let me start with diet, what are some of the really crippling diseases or foods for the kidney? What's going to set us up for kidney disease? Right, so if you said, what are some of the big stuff that I can modify very easily? It's salt, sugar, fat. That's it right there. But those are so addictive. They are so, and that's why they're so addictive, right? So food manufacturers know that if you want your customers to come back, the more salt, the more sugar, the more fat you put in. And we used to think that different parts of the tongue would be only responsible for certain flavors. That's not true. The entire mouth is like this one big, gigantic place that loves the taste of salt, sugar, and fat. So what are the sort of the best foods to get it with? Well. You have all your meats that fall into that category. Red meat and processed meats are the worst offenders of them all, and it's probably the easiest way to get all the fats. And the way they're cooked, you get lots of fat, lots of salt, and depending on some of them, even sugar. Sodas and diet sodas, so even diet sodas, there's no such thing as a safe artificial sweetener. Regardless of what people will tell you, my favorite is the green packet, yellow packet, pink packet, orange packet, doesn't matter. What the data shows is, is that artificial sweeteners are linked to metabolic syndrome. I can't say causality, that's only been shown in animal models, not human models. But what we do know is that the people who consume artificial sweeteners finish more of their meal than people who actually took in regular sugar. And so the interesting pathway is, is what does that? And we're just starting to learn that because artificial sweeteners taste so much sweeter than regular sugars, I always tell the analogy to my, my patients, I say, look, you don't want an alcoholic to go into a bar and tell them, don't drink the alcohol. If you keep sending them there, sooner or later, willpower will break. Willpower is a muscle, right? And it gets exhausted. Even though you train it to get better and better every day, it will get exhausted. It's a finite resource. So if you expose people to salt, sugar, and fat, it makes it very hard. So meats are one category. Your sugary and foods are another category. Salt, unfortunately, is used in everything. So the best way to do it is to make whole foods at home in the comfort of your own house. You will control what goes in. Getting a salad on the outside versus getting a salad at home, what's the difference is the salt. Salt is a wonderful preservative. Getting any kind of thing in a box, it doesn't have to say salt on it. If you look into ingredients, it will say sodium X, Y, and Z. Words you've never heard of in the dictionary that don't exist, you can't pronounce, but it's in there. And one of the, the interesting ways that manufacturers have figured out how to trick people is, and this was something that I uh, always joke around with my, <laughs> my own family because my wife one day showed me a can of cooking oil and she said, take a look at this and how it shows that it has zero fat, cooking oil. And I was like, how is that possible that cooking oil is 100% fat and it says on the bottle, 0% fat. So then I looked at the serving size. It was one third of one second. Psst. That's too long, by the way. So oh, for one of those sprays. That's right. Yes. So one spray, which is, has to be less than a second, actually one third of one second. So what the FDA allows for is, is that if you have a serving size less than 0.5 grams, you can just write zero. But what if you had all sorts of different labels for that same type of fat? this type of fat, this type, you could have multiple labels, but the sum of those wouldn't matter because if each individual was 0.5 grams or less, you could get away with it. Mm -hmm. So there's all these tricks to the trade. So yes. when you get food from the outside, or even if you don't know, you can easily get way too much. So salt, sugar, and fat are the biggest culprits. Now you're, you mentioned meat, processed meat, 
Right. What about animal protein? Some you, studies have suggested that they hit the kidneys too. So what the data shows is, and we have very elegant study, in fact, one of the most elegant studies that came out was about a year and a half ago, where they showed that switching from animal protein to plant-based protein had a massive decline in the rate at which your kidneys go down. So in other words, plant-based proteins are associated with a much slower decline. We don't talk about kidney disease reversal per se because what we don't know is, for example, a, a, a graphic example, but you know, if somebody's finger gets cut off, we don't have a means to bring the finger back. So if there is scarring in the kidney, we can't bring that scarring back. But if there's an injury in the kidney, we can reverse it. So when we use the language of reversal, we talk about the injured portion of the kidneys where we can reverse it versus the scarring portion where we want to prevent further scarring. So plant-based proteins, there's lots of evidence. In fact, the talks that I give on kidney disease show that the optimal proteins come from plants. Absolutely. And then in America in general, we are obsessed with the amount of protein. In fact, we consume more protein than just about anybody, yet we have higher rates of osteoporosis, we have higher rates of chronic metabolic diseases than just about anywhere else, and we spend more money than just about anybody else. So what we find is, is that we are obsessed with protein, yet the protein is actually harming our kidneys, it's harming our bones, it's leaching out the calcium and phosphorus from the bones. So all of these are happening from animal-based proteins. You make that transition, you slow down the decline in kidney function. Even if you're on dialysis, does not mean that you know, all hope is lost. 20% of the dialysis patients, so one in five, die every year on dialysis. Five-year death rate is 50% on dialysis. So if you're on dialysis, switching to whole foods, switching to plant-based proteins will actually allow you to beat those statistics. Which is what happened in today's story. Before we go to the break, I want to give you a challenge. Having love and support is a key health promoter. Colossians 3, 12 to 14 says that we should be gentle, kind, humble, meek, and patient. Put up with each other and forgive anyone who does you wrong, just as Christ has forgiven you. Love, it says, is more important than anything else. It's what ties everything completely together. Imagine having a friend with all of those qualities, gentleness, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience along with forgiveness. You definitely want to hang on to that kind of friend, right? Love would naturally flow between you. In Romans 12 verse 10, God says, we should try to outfriend each other. Love each other and outdo each other in showing honor. If you have a competitive nature, there's a great competition. Try to show more love, honor, and respect. It wouldn't hurt us to put a bit more effort into being that kind of friend, right? In fact, the love that underpins all of that would just flow right back, improving the health of our body, our mind, and our spirit. If you want a strong heart, you need cardiovascular fitness. For that, we need to be physically active on a daily basis and really push ourselves at least every other day. So why not squeeze in five minutes with us right now? What have you got for our hearts today, Sean? Five minutes, maybe six minutes. Right? Oh, okay. Let's push a little oh, oh, okay. All right, let's start with a dynamic warm up. all right? We know that we want to get the blood pumping. We want to start, you know, on a good note. We want to feel good starting our workout, all right? We have an upper body workout working our back today. Many of us are on the computer, we're driving, and our backs get a little tight, right? And our chest becomes a little bit more compressed, right? right? Yep. So in order for us to work some of those muscles, we're gonna pull those muscles a little bit and kind of open them up a little bit. But in order for us to get started, we're gonna start with just a leg switch, okay? Where you're here, chest is up, again, getting the heart rate pumping, all right? And I just want you to jump one step at a time, all right? It gets your heart going. It does it? get your heart going, all right? You keep it going. The goal here is to be light on your toes, to use your arms a bit, get a little bit loose, and get relaxed before you get into your workout. Sometimes we start our workouts when we're tense, 
and we put that tension into our workouts and it really doesn't give us a good quality. No, that's right. right. So three, two, and one. These are alternating toe switches. You can use some steps. If you have some steps, do the same thing. You yeah, I do that when I'm filling the car, I guess. There you go. <laughs> it's a good use of time, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so if you have a resistant band, the okay. resistant band comes in a variety of flavors. Uh, this is uh, one where it's not that much tension, but you can get some that have really tight tension or some that's lighter, right? Depending on the exercise, you can vary it up, okay? All right. So for this, what we're gonna do is take the resistant band and put it around our left foot. Once it's here, we're gonna loop it around twice, both sides, and we're gonna work on one side at a time. I want you to think of this as if you are pulling a lawnmower string, okay? All right, all right. So been there, you, done that. Yeah, been there, done that, right? So you're gonna pull this all the way up, pulling and stretching the lat, okay? All the way back down, pull, squeeze, and you'll feel your lats get a good stretch. Your goal here is to bring your elbow back as far as possible, contracting your lat, all right? The lat is the biggest muscle in our back. If we work the lat as much as we can with some heavy weight, we burn a ton of calories. But that is one of the, 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 the muscles that we tend to not work out as much, all right? Right. So we don't want to miss that opportunity. Yeah, right? absolutely. So I would say about 10 to 12 on the right-hand side. And then you do the same thing, wrap it around the other foot. And then you have 10 to 12 on the other side. Again, the goal always is to contract as hard as you can. Uh, think about pulling that lawnmower string, <laughs> all right? This is a functional exercise, stuff that we do in real life. Right. Uh, and it will benefit us in the long run. Yeah, but don't tell your husband that you <laughs> now strengthened your lat. There you, you go. go. That lawnmower, right? <laughs> so now that we have a strong back, we're gonna work some of our delts, okay? Our delts and our back again, putting it all together. Take that same resistant band and go about shoulder width apart. You're gonna keep the, your arms about parallel to the ground and pull it apart. Squeeze as much as you can. And even that's, if you can't yeah. get it all the way back there, that's fine. Right. The art of you trying is what matters most here, okay? So get about 12 to 15, all right? A little bit higher on the rep count. Allow you to work that back as much as possible, all right? I'm Five, working it out here. Four, three, two, and one. Working your delts and your back at the same time. Okay. Now let's put it all together, okay? All right. We're gonna put this right underneath us again. And we're gonna do what they call a high pull, all right? Working our delts all the way up into this V position. What I want you to do is really slow it down and contract as hard as you can. Breathe, breathe, breathe. You don't wanna hold on to your breath, all right? Let it out, let that tension out, and breathe, all right? Keeps your heart rate down. So you have three great exercises to work our upper back, challenge us a bit, at the same time, get our heart yeah, my heart's working. going, I hope yours is too. It's all about cardiovascular oh, work. Yeah, right. right. There you go. So grab a resistant band, choose a resistant band level that will challenge you, aim for a good higher amount of reps to get that cardiovascular component, and challenge yourself. Oh, thanks, Sean. There you oh, go. we got Well, we, we got, got it. We, we got, got a stretch, stretch right? right? So let's yep. take that right arm since we worked our shoulders and our delt, bring it across the body, breathe, inhaling through your nose, exhaling through your mouth. Three, two, one, get the other side, pull, working your delt, working your shoulder, and also stretching out your lat, okay? Mm. Shake it out, and you are good to go. Ooh, can they do a raise and say a high five? Oh, yes, uh, they're struggling to do that. Yes, Ooh. They can. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. You're very welcome. Raisins and dried apples are delicious additions to any breakfast cereal. Not only do they add a sweet crunch, they may also reduce your risk of pancreatic cancer. According to the Adventist Health Study, individuals who ate dried fruits frequently had one-fifth the risk of pancreatic cancer than those who rarely ate them at all. Why not sprinkle some dried blueberries on your dinner zone or snack on dried apricots to satisfy that sweet tooth? Enjoying dried fruits often is another ageless advantage. There's no dumb questions, so I love to get your questions. And here's one that someone called in. What are the best foods to eat if you have thyroid problems? Actually, this is a really popular question. Well, first and foremost, make sure you are taking medications for your thyroid that will balance your hormones, whether your thyroid is overactive or underactive. And then be sure you don't overdo iodine or soy protein. Some is fine, but just don't go real heavy on it. And uh, then focus on nutrition and exercise because they're really gonna help 
keep your weight and your energy levels optimal because those are really majorly affected by thyroid issues. Then maximize how much nutrition you can get out of your food. Don't just think about what you can put on your plate. Think about what nutrition will come off your plate. You know, veggies are way out in front when it comes to nutrition. Fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, just that nice mix with some healthy fats from the nuts and seeds, they're all going to work together to keep you well nourished. And the other thing about diet, that sort of diet will combat inflammation which will balance the immune system and balance the thyroid. So often um, people have an autoimmune thyroid disease where there's inflammation or um, the immune system is attacking it. That's commonly called Hashimoto's. And it's important in that condition to avoid allergenic foods that will stimulate the immune system. And the common ones are gluten and dairy. So, so some people with Hashimoto's get off the gluten and dairy and their thyroid antibody levels drop as they eliminate that trigger food that's targeting their thyroid. Caitlin posted, my brother has stomach ulcers. What is the best diet for him? Well, Caitlin, have, have him go through a test that will exclude infection with Helicobacter pylori or H. pylori. And if it's there, it needs to be treated. And it's a complicated back, um, antibacterial regime, but it's important to do that. And then you want to encourage him to avoid alcohol, smoking, hot spices, and if he is stressed, manage his stress. Those are all so important for stomach acid and, and stomach ulcers. Now, a treatment is to take one tablespoon of slippery elm barks, mix it in about a quarter cup of aloe vera juice, and drink that about two hours after meals. Now, it's not supposed to taste good. It is medicine after meals and then before bed. Now, Amanda posted, I'm interested to know more about fasting from a spiritual perspective. Well, fasting is mentioned over 50 times in the Bible, always associated with prayer. Jesus talked about fasting as something his disciples would do, not if they would do it, but when they would do it. And he said of the demon that was uh, inflicting the child, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So fasting is used in the context of that in the context of repentance and when they were selecting leaders in the early church. Now physically it allows the body to detoxify and sort of spring clean. It clears the mind and it often allows deeper sleep. So if you put all that together you'll find you get a more intense focused time for communication between you and God and a greater earnestness in your soul when you're fasting. I'd encourage you to try it. Now, if any of you have a question, send it in by Facebook text or go to our website and my team and I will do our best to answer it. Like us on Facebook and join us there. Now, let's see what we could have for dinner tonight. Lemons are the most commonly used citrus. They're native to Asia, but they've migrated all over the world. We use their juice and their zest more than we use their pulp, so look for smooth, brightly colored skin. And if the fruit feels heavy for its size, then it should be nice and juicy. The juice is useful to preserve foods that oxidize and discolor quickly, like apples, bananas, or avocados. Once squeezed, there's a quick loss of vitamin C, so be sure to drink your lemonade right away. Recent animal research suggests that citrus have anti-cancer properties. Also, if you want to alkalinize your body in the mornings, then squeeze fresh lemon juice into your morning water. But be careful, it will erode the enamel on your teeth. So you better use a straw. Bon appetit. Today's show is about kidney disease and diet, and we're talking with Dr. Sean Hashmi, a nephrologist and weight management expert. In the previous segment, he mentioned too much dietary phosphorus can be a problem. Here he explains. So phosphorus comes in a variety of different forms. There's inorganic and then there's organic. Inorganic is the one that basically goes right in your gut and gets absorbed, and that's things like cheese and sodas. Organic phosphate comes bound. It has to unbind inside your gut and then go in. And then there's animal-based and there's plant-based. The beauty of plant-based phosphorus is that its absorption is 50% less than animal-based phosphorus. That's a huge yeah. difference. And why should you care? Because every one milligram of increase in phosphorus, your risk of mortality or death actually goes up quite dramatically. So phosphorus, unfortunately, 
you need a certain amount because if it's too low, can't function, you can't even breathe. So there's a certain amount you need. But for Americans, every American out there gets more than their share of phosphorus. So it's way too much anyways. And the best way to lower that is processed foods. So even if you're getting, let's say, a purely vegan meal, but it comes in a package, you want to make sure that what are the ingredients. You know, my dietitian colleagues will tell you, if you can't read the ingredient, right? It's an old saying, but I tell you there's a lot of truth to that. The chemical companies say, well, every, you know, fruit has all these chemicals you can't pronounce. Yes, but that's, that's kind of like going into the straws and kind of nitpicking. The concept is still the same. Read the box. If you can't understand the ingredients, your body can't understand it either. So you shouldn't eat it. Right, so processed food is going to be a yes. key place to get that phosphate. Correct. Cheese, so sodas, processed foods. Mm. Now, calcium. Tell yes. us about calcium in the kidneys. Because, yeah. you know, for years, we've, especially older women, have been popping lots of calcium. Yeah. I think we're obsessed with calcium. Yes. We have thought that just by taking more calcium and vitamin D, which is, once again, a billion-dollar industry, the, the thought process there is, is by consuming more of these things, somehow we'll lower the risk of osteoporosis. We compare ourselves to, let's say, the Mediterranean region. We'll find they have far lower rates of osteoporosis, and yet they take in far lower meat, far lower calcium, far lower vitamin D than we do. And that makes a very interesting question. What is it about what they do versus what we do? We know that, for example, in the meat size, it's very acidic and leaches the calcium and phosphorus from bones. We also know that all that calcium that we're taking in, if you're looking at a balance of what happens with the calcium, if you look at the urine, it doesn't come out in the urine. If you look at the blood, it's not really raising the blood. And then you look at the gut. Once we have enough calcium, our GI tract doesn't turn off the ability for the calcium to keep going in. So if it doesn't come out in the urine, it doesn't rise in the blood. Where did the calcium go? The tissues. It goes and deposits inside your blood vessels, inside the tissues, makes all your beautiful, flexible blood vessels become hard like lead pipes. So our obsession with calcium and D is a little bit overboard. If we started at an early age to move more, to love more, and by love I mean express gratitude, be mindful, have closer relationships, to sleep more, and to focus on whole foods, you would find that our osteoporosis rates would go down, just like that. Not magical, not miraculous, but the hard part is it doesn't make anybody money. And when it doesn't make anybody money, there isn't a reason for us to run around and emphasize it. This is why conferences and societies like ACLM, what they're doing is they're creating ambassadors of change with a very noble purpose, and that's why I'm so proud to be a part of it. Now, we, you mentioned fat earlier as, yes. as one of the key things, and then you just mentioned about the hardening of your arteries. So cholesterol and fat, what do they do to the kids? Yeah, this is an interesting part is there's so much new data that's coming out that people are running around saying, you know, saturated fat, it doesn't harm you anymore. You don't have to worry about it. And the problem with all of this data is, is unless you're somebody who's used to critically analyzing studies, you wouldn't understand the nuances. And the nuances, whenever you look at a study, you have to understand what did they account for? What was their biases? Did they have recall biases of a food frequency questionnaire? Did they have a bias where what their exclusion criteria was was designed in a way to give them statistically significant results? There are so many different biases. Are they replicated? Are they, is it a group of people that's so narrow that it never applies to anybody? There's a certain study out right now called the PURE trial and where they were talking about how saturated fat wasn't bad. Yet when you really analyze the study, all it tells you and it's something we already knew, but we don't talk about enough, is the greatest issue we're talking about food and nutrition is economic inequality. Economic inequality, meaning specifically that poverty is a risk factor for death. That's what the PURE study showed, not that saturated fat is somehow de-villainized and it's better. So saturated fat, what we know is that when it comes to the kidneys, like anything else, if you harden your vessels, you decrease the blood flow to the kidneys, you decrease it, the kidney is an interesting organ. It is willing to sacrifice itself for the greater good, the heart and the brain. So if it's, let's say you're bleeding, 
it will try to turn on the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system to basically clamp down the blood flow so that you're diverting blood flow to everywhere else. But the RAS system can turn on for different reasons. And if it's hardening and there's less blood going to the kidneys, the kidney says, oh, well, maybe there's less blood to the other organs, let me shut it down. It shuts down and as a result of it, it does the self-fulfilling prophecy of killing itself from the inside. And that's why saturated fat is such a big deal. It hardens the arteries, kills the kidneys. Coming straight ahead, we'll look at how to get your kidneys tested and finish today's story, so stick around. Rabbi Newman used to be obese, with heart disease and kidney failure so bad he was supposed to start on renal dialysis but his brother was an alternative medicine doctor who wanted to treat the cause. So he sent him to Weimar for an 18-day lifestyle program. Soon, the rabbi was off his 25 medications, he was walking again and enjoying a plant-based diet. When he got home, he continued on the program and lost 110 pounds. Watch what happened next. I got home and everything was fine. I followed all the things how they told me to cook and to do, and I did it. And at that point, they said that uh, it's okay, I don't need dialysis, because I had lost weight and everything else. Everything was sort of starting to click in. Seven or eight months later, it was the holidays, and everybody was screaming at me that I'm crazy because I, I'm, I'm not probably getting enough protein, I'm not getting enough food, I'm not getting enough anything. And I had to go to one place to stay at. And the problem was that she didn't have enough room in the fridge for me to bring the vegan stuff. So she said, I'm sorry, I don't have any room. So I ended up not taking it. And when I got there, the only foods that they had was regular food and I had no choice. So I ate and once I ate, I fell off the wagon and it got to a point afterwards that I, you know, not that I gained more weight, but everything was not 100% because I was eating the meat, I was eating fish, I was eating chicken. So I guess that was working on me where again, I was feeling sluggish, I had no oomph at all. And uh, Again, my brother told me, who was an alternative medicine, he says, you're going back. So I said, I, how can, you're going back. So I made the, my son made the arrangements and I came back for the second time now. And I'm glad that I came here and I'm feeling a hundred times better than what I did when I left New York and God willing, this time, I'm not letting go of that wagon. God willing, indeed. I asked Dr. Hashmi if dietary fiber protects the kidneys. Fiber protects just about everything. Fiber is one of the simplest, easiest, most miraculous things that we know about to mankind that we don't do enough of. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about fiber supplements because there's no data. Those big jars of fiber, there's no data. It's from food. Food is the best fiber and it lowers your risk for all sorts of cancers, for kidney disease, for high blood pressure, for diabetes, you name it and there's a benefit to fiber. Yet the typical American only gets 10 grams, if they're lucky, of fiber per day. And those guys who are running around talking about the paleo diet, if you look at our ancestors, they weren't hunters and gatherers. They were gatherers and then hunters. And on average, they got 100 grams of fiber per day to our measly 10. And that fiber wasn't from meat. It was from gathering, right? They were scavengers. So we don't get enough fiber. It's a miraculous thing in my opinion. It's cheap. Beans are awesome. We should all have beans. I think there should be a national bean eating day. Well, we're talking about the kidney. What are the tests of kidney function that the, your doctor might order? Right, so there's two really basic tests that you need. The first one, which is something that we do when we do community fairs to check for kidney disease, it's a simple urine sample. You just pee in a cup. We check for protein in the urine. Your kidneys have a nice, tight 
barrier. And normally they spill very trace amounts of protein. But if you see that there's protein, that means the barrier is broken. When that barrier is broken, we know that proteinuria or albuminuria, which is just another term, is a fancy way of saying that we are having a mechanism of destruction inside the kidney. Proteinuria dramatically increases your mortality. It's an incredibly strong predictor. One of the things people often confuse with protein in the urine or proteinuria is, if I replace protein that I'm losing, will that work? Well, the answer is no, you'll make it worse. So a couple of things when you lose protein in the urine. When you lose protein, what is protein? Protein is your immune system. It's all your antibodies. It's those wonderful things that fight off infection. It's those wonderful things like protein C, protein S, antithrombin 3, that prevent blood clots. So what happens to people with massive proteinuria? Much higher risk for blood clots, much higher risk for infections. So very big deal. And of course, their cholesterol goes through the roof. Now, when we talk about kidney function and you have proteinuria, we need to figure out why. The other way we check kidneys, we don't have a direct way of checking kidneys, so the other way is through creatinine. And creatinine comes from muscle. So what happens is, if you had somebody who lost a lot of weight, it may look like their kidney function improved, but it didn't. It's just that they have less muscle, so they produce less creatinine. Why should you care? Because if you have somebody who, God forbid, has a serious illness, they're not eating, they're losing weight, you may be fooled into thinking their kidneys got better when they didn't. A good rule of thumb is every time you see that creatinine level double, so one to two, you lose 50% of your kidney function. Now, most people in our age category, their creatinines are around one. But you may have an elderly person who may be 90 years old, very frail, have a creatinine of 0.5. The doctor may not even notice that when that 0.5 goes to 1, they're like, it's still in the normal range. Well, it doubled from 0.5 to 1, and they've already lost 50% of their kidney function. We should be worried. So when you have kidney disease, it is a very serious thing. You don't need to give them back protein. In fact, 0.8 grams per kilogram per day of preferably Plant-based proteins is what we recommend. Protein restriction, there's good data to show that it works. And when you say protein restriction, how much? Po still the 0.8 or yeah. would you go even lower? You can go lower. There's a fine point. The, the latest study that came out where they went at 0.3 grams per kilogram per day, they actually added keto analogs of essential amino acids so people wouldn't get malnourished. It was done under the supervision of doctors and dietitians as a team. So they had amazing results, amazing. But to get it that low without getting somebody malnourished requires a lot of um, close contact. See, the beauty of plant-based meals are you don't have to worry about the protein. You can eat all the food you want, and you're still getting a low-protein diet but you're getting enough protein to be healthy, yet at the same time, not so much that you get all those adverse reactions. So my philosophy is we should never be trying to count the macronutrients. We should never have to count carbs, never have to count fat, and never have to count protein. What we should do is adopt what Harvard does and what Kaiser Permanente does, which is the healthy plate. Half of your plate is non-starchy vegetables. What are non-starchy vegetables? Mm. It's a salad, that's it, right? So half your plate is a salad. It could also be broccoli of and course. cauliflower and in, that's, right. in that sense. Correct, yeah. correct. A quarter of your plate is your protein and a quarter of your plate is your starches. So brown rice, right, whole grains, that's it. Tofu, which I love, beans for protein, they're great. And then whatever greens you like, half your plate. And what should you eat first, trick question? <laughs> Always the greens. Why? Part of that is, is it's human psychology is, when I educate people to make changes, what I tell them is we want to be moving from restrictive to realistic. We don't want to get into a state where all I ever tell you is don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat that. That's food insecurity. So what I want to do is get you the most nutritious, fibrous foods in first, let them do all the good, and then if you do go for other things like dessert or whatever it is, don't feel guilty, just do it. This is the same thing I do with my children is I'm trying to teach them better habits, but I also want to get away from creating food insecurity by telling them no, 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 into, have this, and if you have that, 
then you can do this. And what that allows them to do is help them to make better choices. I let them pick. Here's a couple options. Which one would you like? Autonomy is such an important part of who we are. And we should always respect people's autonomy. It's really important to allow that respect, to allow that relationships. Food is culture. Our kidneys filter blood, remove toxins and waste, manage water and keep salts, mineral and protein in sync. Diabetes, hypertension and obesity all challenge the health of our kidneys, resulting in renal failure, dialysis and death. If we take care of them, they will last us a whole lot longer. But how do we do that? Basically, eat more plants and fewer animal products. That reduces phosphorus, avoids excess protein and drops saturated fat intake. Then you want to drink lots of water, not soda pop. And at mealtime, make half your plate veggies, a quarter something with protein and a quarter something with complex carbohydrates and start by eating the veggies. That's all from me today. Thanks for joining us on Go Healthy For Good. I'll see you next time. Thank you.